Okay, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's begin. This session is um, going to lead up to writing to GOD attacks. So there's going to be some amount of um, theory that we cover before we go to that attack. And uh, this will also be relevant to what you had done in the previous session, which was on um, Red to Lipsy. So, yeah. Um, the contents, first we're gonna go over shared libraries, um, then position independent code or executable. Then we're gonna see the PAT and the GOT tables and then um, go towards another concept called rel row and then we're gonna see the exploits. Yeah. So shared libraries. Um, yeah, there are objects uh, that can be reused. Um, by our program. So examples are Lipsy, and we usually include the uh, libraries in, in, at the start of our um, C program. We include the headers. So, you know, hash include all that. So those are where we're including the headers for the libraries. Now each library has two sections. Um, they have a, a, a function, they have two tables. They have a functions tables and a constants table and it gets relevant later on but yeah that's how so every library will have these two sections so maybe that's just so say this is one library it has uh this is a functions table and then there's another uh, constant table like that you have multiple libraries that are shared by each of our program and uh, within a library the, um, okay, so this is specific to, like it's very relevant to Lipsy. You've probably seen it in Red to Lipsy attack. The various functions or constants in your specific version of Lipsy is going to be the same. So uh, with offsets, you if you know the address of one function, using offsets, you can get the address of another function. Yeah. Okay, then um, there's linking, there's something called linking. So when we compile a program, we need to link that program with the libraries that we are using. So that process uh, is what is linking and yeah, we're attaching them to the executable. So when you do a, a, a yeah, there are two main kinds of link, linking done, static linking, and then there's dynamic linking. So static linking is, uh, the entire libc is brought into the, like you load the entire libc along while, so uh, when you compile your program, the entire uh, libc is loaded into together with the program. So you need to create a space in the virtual memory, which has space for the entire thing, entire libc along with the program itself, the entire thing. Whereas for dynamic linking, uh, and there are, there, there's another thing, all the code in the library gets stored in, oh, sorry, yeah, it gets stored in the binary. And this leads to the binary taking up a lot of space. So the final file that you create during compilation is huge. Yeah. And uh, with GCC, you can do static linking. But mostly the default thing is dynamic linking. Yeah, so another thing in dynamic linking is your file size is smaller and also the there are some addresses in Lipsy which are not yet resolved and on, which only get resolved during runtime. So um, a little more linking happens while the for, for function, while the program is being run. So whereas in static linking, the entire linking is done during the compilation for dynamic linking. Some of it is done during compilation, but a little bit is also done while it's run. So every time you run it, some amount of linking happens. Yeah. And there are two main advantages of dynamic linking. One uh, is that it, the final file, the executable that you create on compilation will be smaller. And the second thing is, uh, the libraries can be modified without having to recompile the binaries. This means that, um, say I 
uh, had created a Libc, uh, sorry, I created a C program sometime back, and I had a different version of Libc back then. And I want to run that same program in the future after I get a new version of Libc. I get an update or something. So uh, I won't have to recompile my um, uh, program. It will still run because but during runtime, it again links with the, the latest Libc that I have on my system and it runs it that way. And I can even get newer versions of Libc and uh, do it with that. Uh, I, I can, I don't have, like within my system, I can have multiple versions of Libc and uh, uh, dynamically link my program with a specific version each time I run it and do it that way. So this really helps in certain um, exploits, like in certain CTF questions, they'll be giving us a, uh, um, like the, the executable uh, will also be running remotely. And on the remote server, it links to a particular Libc version. And they they sometimes, to make it easier for us, they give us that Libc version. So we need to download that Libc version and somehow link it to the executable and run it. So because, uh, so that's right, that's an advantage of dynamic linking. It can link to any uh, version. You don't have to recompile it for that. Okay. So there's something called LD.SO. This is the dynamic uh, linker. And uh, this is what resolves the addresses while the thing is while the program is being run. Yeah. And SO is a shared object. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to figure out what version of Libc you're running or things like that, you can use LDD and um, also you can, you know, you could just do Libc and then grep for version. It's usually there within the uh, thing itself. So yeah, the, check this out. So here you see a Libc or a sort of six, it, it's always like this and yeah. Now we come to the next topic, uh, position independent code and position independent executable. So um, this is a concept by which, uh, so when you have position independent code, it, uh, the code executes properly anywhere. So it can load into virtual memory anywhere and it can work. It, it's not hard coded in memory. It's not, it, it's not fixed. It doesn't have to run in a specific place uh, where it was written. So that's the advantage with uh, position independent code. Uh, and binaries written with PIC are called position independent executable PIE. Yeah. So how does PIC work? PIC uses relative addressing. The addresses of the instructions in PIC are specified simply using a fixed offset from a base address, which is not fixed. So it loads the entire thing in a random place in um, memory okay and the base address will now change but the offsets of other functions from the base don't change uh, you've probably seen that already in a uh, red ellipse attack where we needed to find the uh, uh, addresses of specific functions so that we could get the offset from the base so if um, you know this was our base and uh, say we're using, we somehow leaked the address of puts and the system somewhere over here. So when we know the, when we know the version of uh, libc, if we get the address of puts, we always know the offset. So we can calculate the new address of system and that's how we can run it. Um, and uh, we have to leak the address of puts because of this position independent code concept that it loads into some random place in memory. So this address, the exact address of puts will be different for each runtime. That's why we need to do that. Uh, Rests of all instructions loaded. After loading change every time the binary is executed, but the offsets between them stay the same. Base addresses and relative offsets. So yeah, here uh, there's a zero address. Is my mouse visible? 
I'm just curious. Uh, not really. Okay, so I think I'll have to try it. Is that okay? Never mind. No, no. Okay, I'll just be reading it out. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so zero, this is the very first, this is the base address. It's written as zero, but when it actually gets loaded into memory, it won't be zero, it'll be some value. And then the others will be at the same offset. So if it's some, something something random here it could be that thing plus two and then plus six that's how the new addresses will get fixed okay the numbers uh yeah no the numbers next to these instructions are not the absolute addresses but simply the offsets relative to the base address of the binary the offsets always remain fixed so this was just demonstrating the offsets remain the same okay so this is a, a demonstration of that um, in this, this is just a hello world program followed by two more print instructions printing the addresses of main and um, address. So there are two functions. It just prints out the addresses of main and address. So um, when we run it, okay. Also, um, if you want to reveal the protections that are present in the binary, we use checksec. And there are a few ways you can use checksec. You just write checksec and press enter. It'll show you the different ways in which you can write checksec. This is one of them. And uh, you get to know, uh, like these are the four main, um, yeah, you get to know these things. So railroad we'll be discussing towards the end of this session. Stack. Um, so if there's a canary present, I think canary, canary has been covered. You know what canary is. Then if uh, NX, which is enabled or not, um, NX stands for no executable. So if that, um, if, uh, yeah, if NX bit is enabled, I think it doesn't let you run a shell. Yeah, it, that's the, uh, it's a protection feature present to prevent execution of shell. And Pi is position independent code, which we're discussing now. So we see that Pi is enabled. Now, when we run it multiple times, the first time it shows that the address is at 5E83271AB169. If you look at that image, uh, look at the first dot slash hello world, we see hello world, and then main function is at. It's something followed by 169, and the next thing, ADDR function is at. Uh, a similar thing and just the last three uh, digits are different. When we see multiple runs of it, we notice that the last three things are the same. So always main is at something 169 and uh, ADDR is always at something 191. Look at all the four things that are present. You'll notice that. This is because um, what happens with uh, by or ASLR, it doesn't, it, like the base address is not something extremely random. The base address is always uh, something like 5E83271A, something 000. So that's how it is. And when, uh, so the offsets will be at similar locations. The always, always the last three things are 000, something like that. Okay. So um, on running the binary, we find that the addresses of main and, and ADDR are different during each uh, execution. This is because ASLR, which randomizes the base addresses of the binary between executions. But on closer, in, clo closer inspection, we see that the difference between the addresses of main and ADDR is fixed. So the offsets we see are the same. In fact, the last three uh, digits are also the same. OK, so um, look at the thing at the bottom. Main is always located in offset of 0x1169 related to the base address. So if we know that the base, like this is at 1169 from the base address, and we go back, we can determine what the base address is. So if you see the first one, the first uh, run, the base address would be 0x5e83271aa000. So that's the new base address and uh, plus 1169, you get the address of main. Okay, and we see that here in this image that 
Okay. Uh, also, I think it was mentioned in the previous thing. The addresses that you see in GDB are uh, just the offsets relative to the uh, base address of zero. So they're just the offsets. Yeah. Since the offsets never change between execution functions like binary, GDR, et cetera, do not move around within the binary. Okay. Now, um, we'll discuss PIE and ASLR. So uh, they're very much linked. ASLR cannot work without um, the code being position independent. So um, I have to draw something. The binary has multiple sections in it. Okay, so right on top. Right on top is the kernel and the OS. And then um, environment vari variables, TV, not that important. Then come, come to a binary, the stack. Uh, yeah, the heap, data section, code, and like that, multiple sections of the binary. So, uh, what PIE does is it makes these things into individual sections and it can randomize it, like it says that this, this part this part this part and this part now can get loaded into any place they don't have to be consecutive in the same order in which it doesn't have to be in a specific order so that's what pi does it allows it to be made into these chunks and put into different places what aslr does it randomizes that thing so if stack is here it's going to put heap data and code, it's going to randomize these offsets between the sections. That's what ASLR does. So it, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it definitely randomizes it. So, and also, uh, okay, let's go from the first point. Pi is a compile time thing. So you decide whether you want the uh, binary or the executable to be position independent or not during compilation. Okay, but ASLR is a runtime thing. So for specific instances of running the executable, you can decide to turn on ASLR, or turn it on. And ASLR can be turned on and off for the uh, on or off for the entire environment. Then the next thing is PI is done by GCC. Um, yeah, it's the binary, for, okay, that's done by GCC. ASLR is a thing done by the OS or the kernel. Okay, now let's consider the case when a PIE is on and ASLR is off. Okay, so here the addresses can but need not be randomized. So I can have randomization, but it's not necessary. It, it, it's not it, like it, it's not guaranteed that between every runs the addresses will get randomized, but they may get randomized. If both PI and ASLR are on, then the addresses will definitely get randomized. Every between every instance of the run, uh, the addresses like always change. Okay, and for ASLR to work, PI is a requirement. So we'll consider four cases: PIE and ASLR. So first is where both are off. Okay, that's when both of them are hard coded in memory. They can only be run from a particular place. They can't be loaded into any place as required. Okay, yeah. Then when PI is off and ASLR is on, this doesn't make sense because ASLR requires uh, PI to be enabled for it to uh, work. Then if both of them are, um, if, if this is on and this is off, in that case, uh, you know, the addresses may be randomized, but it's not guaranteed. And if both are on, that is what usually happens, then it is it, it's going to definitely get randomized. So. Excuse me for the lighting. OK. Not applicable and. Hard coded. Okay. 
Now, um, PIE and shared objects. So uh, the main application of PIE is when we make the shared libraries position independent so that they can be loaded in any place in memory. It, it, uh, yeah, so that, so that I can have, uh, yeah. PIE is commonly used for shared libraries such as Libc so that the same library code can be loaded at a different location in each program's address space in such a way that it does not overlap with other memory in use by other shared libraries. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, it, it, help, it, it really helps because there's something called, um, a little more complicated called paging. And, um, but we'll not get into that anyway. So uh, the Lipseek is like, there's a separate library that's being loaded into virtual memory. Then the executable itself is being loaded. So these things can be loaded into separate places and wherever it finds space in the virtual memory, it just loads. It doesn't have to find one fixed place which has a huge amount of memory to load up everything in it. Uh, and you don't have to run it from a specific place all the time. So yeah, so the main, like one of the main places where PIE is useful is for Lipsy, for making it more, um helpful <laughs> the base address of the shared library uh libc.so and ld.so etc are randomized and different each time due to aslr so i think uh, we get to see the addresses here yeah just look at these at uh, uh, these addresses on the top they're different every time zero x zero 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 the first one uh um, libc.so.6 in that, the last thing that's given there. So you'll see that they're a little different between each run. That's because of ASLR and it's basically loaded into a different place every time. Okay, so um, for obfuscation, it is a security feature. Yeah, go ahead, read that. So because it's randomized every time, uh, it you know it's different every time. So you can't get to know the address of say system function. You don't have that already known. So yeah, you you have to at least put in some more effort to find it, like how you did it to Lipsy attack. Okay. Now PRT and GOT. This is the next concept. These are two tables, um, sections of like, they're called PLT, oh yeah, they were tables. So procedure, linkage table, and global offset table. They're sections of the binary and very much like the dot text and dot data section. Now this image is very interesting. You'll see a lot of uh, nice things here. So I think you can already see dot PLT, which is highlighted, yeah. Then below that, there is dot PLT dot GOT section. Uh, yeah, and right at the bottom, there is dot GOT section. Okay, these become, these are important. And uh, what else? There are more things that are interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, I missed one thing. Okay, we will do that at the end. Library part. Okay, procedure linkage table. PLT is the procedure linkage table is section within the binary which is used to call external functions and procedures. The PLT also invokes a dynamic linker LD.SO, which resolves the addresses of the functions and loads it into the binary during runtime. Okay, so there'll be a lot of theory here, which we'll go through slowly, but first I'll give you a basic idea and then I'll show you a demonstration that we'll go through this. So, um, yeah. So this is how the function call happens. Within our code section, we probably have certain, uh, say, puts functions in our C program. Puts, okay. And then we have uh, another puts. So when, when we can, now we compile the C program, we have an ELF file. Okay. Now, when we when we run that, uh, when it encounters the first puts, 
it doesn't directly have any uh, it does it doesn't directly go to the pulse function in libc it doesn't have access to that what it does is uh, during runtime it calls puts at plt so it goes to the plt table the puts entry at the plt table so you have the plt table the uh, my diagrams are pretty bad yeah uh, the code um, it calls a function at plt so whatever function so puts at plt it calls that so from there it jumps to the plt table now in the plt table there are three main uh, lines under it the first one is going to be a jump to the got table the next line is um, it uh, prepares the resolver it will usually send an integer it will push an integer onto the stack and the third line uh, it jumps to um, a place where the resolution starts taking place okay like it it, it uses le.so and it starts resolving it uh, yeah so and i'll show you a demo after this which will make it very clear yeah so the first time puts is being called it will go to the plt table from the plt table it gets this it gets this jump instruction to go to uh, the got entry for this so now it goes to the got table oh god it goes to the got table at the got table the first time it is run um i i remember i said that some addresses are still not uh, resolved and the link it, those are going to be linked during runtime yeah so these addresses in libc for the puts function has not yet been resolved so the got table doesn't yet have the address for puts yet so it's empty and just right after that there is a um, jump back to the next instruction in on the plt table so it jumps back to the PL table, it prepares the resolver, and then using the resolver, it resolves the address of puts function, for, and it finds uh, a way to go to, so from here it goes to GOT, and then goes back to PLT table, because it doesn't have the address right now, then uses the resolver, and it resolves the address for puts in actual libc yeah so now we call the real puts function and we return back to our um, you know normal the, the 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 main function okay we go back to the main function or wherever from where it the puts was initially called yeah and we just return back to the code section of our program okay now the second time puts is called so second time puts is called, we'll again have puts at PLT. From there, we now go to the GOT table, but this time, um, you know, the last time that it resolved the address in Libc, it had stored that address now in the GOT table. So now you have the address in the GOT table. From there, again, it, it directly goes to puts now. It doesn't have to resolve it again. It, it's already resolved due to the previous run, and that's how it works. So this is um, this is the first time a function is called, and this is the second time it's called. So code will go to the PLT table. PLT goes to GOT. GOT goes to the actual uh, uh, puts at libc, and then it returns back to the code section. Okay. So actually, before yeah, I'll show or before showing the demonstration, I will just go through the, all this uh, theory part here. It's whatever I said, just elaborated. So um, invokes a dynamic linker le.so, which resolves the address of the function and loads it into the binary during runtime. That's what I spoke about. It resolves the address of puts the first time it is invoked. Okay. Um, dynamically linked libc functions such as printf puts etc are not stored in the binary but are linked to it during runtime by the dynamic linker since they are not themselves part of the binary the binary simply contains a symbol representing the function plt entry so the actual address is not resolved you just have a symbol of it at plt that's how it is indicated yeah so printf at plt stuff like this so you can you see in the image this is the from the disassembly of the main function something like that on gdb you'll see puts at plt so um 
it's, it doesn't call puts exactly, it calls, it calls puts at PLT. So then you jump to the PLT set, uh, uh, part of our binary. Okay. Instruction following the function call is present in the PLT section of the binary. Yeah. So, um, so he, he was uh, here, puts at PLT, he goes to the next instruction. I think that that's step, uh, single step, I, I'm not sure. Uh, step into, I think. Okay, puts at PLT. And then you step one more step, you go one more step further, you see this puts, um, okay, look at the second equal to arrow that's present. Right at the end of that line, you see puts at got.plt. Okay, so it goes to the got table. Now we'll discuss that. The got table ha now has two parts to it. Okay, this is our got table. There is one part called uh, got dot plt yeah and that's just the got so remember i told you each library has um, library has a functions table and a constants table so this is we're, we're right now talking about partial railroad partial railroad which is um, most relevant to us in that case what happens is got.plt is the section of the global offset table which told which is supposed to have the addresses for the functions part functions and just the got section stores the stuff for the constants okay and an example of a constant is uh, the string slash bin slash sh which you would have come across in right ellipse okay so during partial railroad, what happens is it resolves the addresses of all the constants and it stores it into GOT during the load time itself. But it does not resolve the addresses of the functions. It leaves those unresolved. Okay. And those are only resolved during runtime. Okay. And this is, I mean, this is also resolved during runtime only, but it's resolved before we begin the, the like we before, like it, this is also resolved every time that the executable is run, but it's done at the load time. It, when the executable is loading, that time we resolve the constants and then we continue with going over the, uh, the, the program. And then when we come across a function, that is when we resolve the functions. That's when we do the, G, that's when we go to, this is GOT.plt section. So in the beginning, this section of the code just has, uh, say, puts at GOT.plt. And the, like, the address below it is empty. And then there's a return instruction. Uh, there's a return instruction to uh, back to puts, uh, back to PLT. And so it's empty. And then there is, a, a, say, printf. At, P, at got dot plt, but it's empty. But these constants are already resolved and kept. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I was talking about. The got table has two sections. Okay. Now this process of doing it twice, like, you know, the first time not having it resolved uh, and resolving it using the dynamic linker and storing it in GOT. And second time when we run it, that is when we resolve it. This entire process is called lazy binding. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so the first time it's called, it jumps to the PLT entry and uh, it jumps to the corresponding GOT entry for that fun. Uh, okay, we'll just do the demonstration. It's quite interesting. Okay, so right now I have a um, executable from the pawn 108 from try hack me. I'm not going to show the like exploit it here, but I'm just going to like it just to show how these things work. So if I open it with GDB, yeah, GDB, uh, and I open my executable. Why didn't Jeff open? Oops. 
Huh? What happened to Jeff? Okay. Oh, oh I, I think I opened too much and got over it. Oh, why did I close it? Oh, God. Okay, never mind. Uh, Where did my Jeff go? Okay, I, I won't be able to see it the same way without Jeff. Just disappeared. Sorry, um, I'll try to fix that and towards the end. Maybe I can show you what I mean. But fine, we'll go through uh, the slides then. Oh God, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, we'll see this. This, is, this also has it properly given here. Um, yeah, just look at this. Uh, this has everything. Okay, so we're on. We're still in the main function. Look at this breakpoint one, which is set at this address in main. So probably the address. Uh, you 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 disassemble main. I'll just disassemble main and let's see. This. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um. Yeah. So, so can you see uh, this? Birds at PLT. So that that that's what something similar is shown here. So we set a breakpoint at this location. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to see if it works. I actually don't want to see puts, puts, no, printf. We see printf. Yeah, uh, and the next printf that we have, this one, Let's have a look at that. Okay, so I set two breakpoints. I hope you understood. I set two breakpoints, one at the address of the first printf and the second one at the address of the next printf after that. Okay, now I'll just um, run it. It comes across the first breakpoint and there, we'll just keep looking at this at the same time. Okay, so puts at PLT. We just go into the next instruction. Uh, so we see it goes to printf at PLT. So right after puts it, uh, sorry, sorry, I have a different function. Anyway, we, we look at this. Uh, puts at PLT, it's at a particular, it's still in the main function from here. Then when we step into the next instruction, it goes, uh, it's from puts at PLT, it jumps in the first instruction under puts at PLT. So it shifts from main plus 56 to puts at PLT. And you see the, the second equal to arrow symbol below it. Yeah, 0x40103030. And now it's at puts at PLT section. Okay. The first instruction under that is a jump instruction to our GOT.PLT table. So puts at GOT.PLT. Okay. Next time, dump of assembler code for the function or puts at PLT. Keyword. Uh, Yeah, so I said through there are three instructions under the PLT section. The first one will be a jump to PLT dot GOT dot PLT. Second one is a 
uh, it push like it, it um, sets up the uh, the 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 this is the yeah no what am I saying it sets <laughs> okay uh, the dynamic linker yeah it gives it a certain it pushes a certain integer onto it and then it jumps to the dynamic linker okay so we disassembled that. Now calling it. Oh, I really wish I could have shown you guys that one with Jeff. I don't know, it just disappeared. And it'll take me time to install it again. Maybe towards the end, I'll reinstall it and probably show. Okay, so here um, we see that this is a global offset table. Push. So this is the PLT section, section dot dot PLT. Okay, just we just go through each slide slowly. This is clearly not the actual code of the function, but merely a step of the function that is present as the PLT section of the binary. So we don't have the actual put call here. We have some other code, uh, which doesn't make sense right now. So it it just puts it into the GOT table and then it again resolves it. All that's there in the PLT section, not the actual puts call puts function. Whenever a function call is encountered, instead of directly calling the actual libc function, the code simply jumps to an entry present in P in the PLT. Okay, now um, th this is the section dot dot GOT. Uh, so just have a look at this. Take it in. Okay. Now lazy binding we discussed and the steps to the call. Okay, look at this. Each PLT entry contains three instructions. The first one jumps to the GOT, uh, jump to the corresponding GOT entry for the function. Preparation of arguments for the addresses resolve resolve a routine and pushing it onto the stack. So we see a, a, an integer is uh, pushed onto the stack. Like I told you that it was zero here, it's three. Look at the second instruction. First one is a jump to the GOT thing. A second one is, a, is pushing a particular instruction. And third one is jumping to the section dot dot PLT. Uh, okay. And then call to the resolver routine, which is present at the beginning of the PLT. Hence jump to the section dot dot PLT. Then jump to GOT entry from pre -LT. Yeah, this is what it's similar to the one we saw that time. So first printf at PLT, then this. Here the code dereferences the pointer and jumps to the address stored at 0x4040030. What's that? What address is that? Yeah, that's the address printf at got.plt. So this is the second step. So we go to the PLT table. Second step is jumping to the GOT table. So we're still um, in step number two. The address is stored, which is the GOT entry of printf, uh, points back to the PLT section at the address this, and not the actual libc address. So this is like if we look at the nitty gritty thing, the initial address point of uh, uh, returns it back to the PLT table. Then we rewrite that address with the actual uh, libc address for the second run. Is not known. Then step three, resolving the address. We have a push instruction three used to identify the function to be resolved by the dynamic linker, your printer, and followed by the jump to the symbol resolver routine. Okay, also uh, it has a specific name. Yeah, uh, underscore DL underscore runtime resolve. So I was able to see all these things properly given in uh, using Jeff, but I, I'll probably be able to show you to, like at the end of today or maybe next session, I'll be taking that too. That will uh, hopefully be a little more organized. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, the function looks up the actual libc address of the called function and rewrites the GOT entry of that function with the new address. This is possible because in this case, the GOT table has both read and write permissions. Okay, so it uh, because we see it has to resolve the address and then write that address back into the got.plt section. So that's why the got.plt section has to be writable. That's another very important thing. This 
has write permissions. And we're going to see how that's useful. That's what we're going to exploit in our uh, exploit. Yeah, <laughs> this is possible because in this case, the GeoGebra table has both read and write permissions. Now jump to the libc function. So step number one was go to PLT. Step number two, go to GOT. Step three was uh, going back to PLT and uh, resolving the actual address. And step four is now jumping to that address. So we've resolved it, now we jump to that address. As soon as the function's address is resolved, control is finally transferred to the actual function present in libc. Now for after the very first call, the GOT entry has been updated to the absolute address of the function present in libc. Okay, we, we saw this. Yeah, now the second case when the function has already been resolved, PLT, from PLT we jump to GOT. Now GOT already has the address which was resolved in the previous time. Okay, so now it already has that address. So we can just use it and it's good. We can, um, it, it directly jumps to the ellipse from there. Except this time, since the GOT entry has already been updated with the actual LIPC function address, it directly jumps to the function in LIPC. This is flow control diagram two. Yeah. Okay, lazy binding as an optimization. Um, simple resolution is done only for those functions that will be called. No resolution takes place at uh, all for functions that are never called in the binary. Okay, that's one very big advantage. We don't spend time resolving other addresses which will never be called. In addition, it also leaves the core or text section of the library completely position independent since the only place where an absolute address is used in the GOT. And that is empty in the beginning. It's only filled in during each runtime. So during each runtime, that's the only time it, uh, it filled up. Yeah. Okay, now, um, yeah, the two sections. Section of the, uh, the dot GOT and dot GOT dot PLT is a section of the binary which contains absolute addresses of the functions and constants that are loaded into the memory space of the program. The dot GOT dot PLT is the subsection of the dot GOT which contains the addresses of those functions that are dynamically linked. Yeah, so uh, only the dot GOT dot PLT part of the GOT has write permissions. This part of the GOT is read only. Now note, this these permission thing is only relevant when we talk about partial railroad. In no railroad and full railroad, it's not the same. So we're talking right now about partial railroad. Okay, in partial railroad, what happens? We'll discuss that in detail later, but know that whatever we discuss right now is for the case of partial railroad only. This part of the GOT is read only. Uh, so the dot GOT section is read only. It has read and execute permissions, probably ex execute it has. And the dot GOT dot PLT has write permissions, which we're going to exploit. Now, relocation. Relocation is a process of assigning load addresses to the data of a program each time it is loaded into memory. This can be carried out at link time right after compiling. So um, this first point is uh, probably static linking. Okay, it, it's it's linked during compilation. Then the next thing, next two are for dynamic linking. So here at load time prior to execution, as in the case of load time relocation. So the stuff that is on, sorry, the stuff that is under uh, GOT dot GOT, these are load time relocations. They are resolved during load time. And the third thing while it's being run as we have seen above while it's being run that is for the dot got dot plt so yeah i hope that's clearly uh, that 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 part is clear okay yeah if you have any doubts so please feel free is the chat If you have any doubts, please uh, uh, do ask in the chat. Okay, 
Now we go to GOT overwrite. This is our exploit. We see that the address of the GOT are overwritten by the resolver because the dot GOT section has both read and write permissions in this case. So this vulnerability can be exploited to override the GOT entry for a particular function with that of an arbitrary function like system, which has been obtained through a leak. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, whatever, say we have a put call in our function and uh, it goes to PLD and then it goes to the GOT. Now the GOT entry has been resolved to give the actual uh, puts address in libc. Okay. Now say we rewrite, we overwrite that with the address of system. So then when we, uh, next time we call puts in our normal code section, instead of calling puts, it will call system because the actual address is that of system. So we're going to use that writing privilege to be able to override that. That's the main idea of the exploit. Okay, before we get into the exploit, there's something called rel row. This is another um, uh, security mechanism. Yeah. So relocation read only is a security feature which um, secures binaries from GOT override attacks. The basic principle of Rero is to resolve addresses of functions at the beginning of execution and make the dot GOT section read only. Rero has two levels, full Rero and partial Rero. So um, partial Rero first. The GOT is simply moved above the program's variable so that it cannot be overwritten into unless a format string is used. So I'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, we'll discuss that. So, um, say my stack is like this. This is the base of the stack. Um, RBP. And Actually, this is the base of the stack. The next eight things are the RBP. Okay, and you have a buffer here, and you know the so the addresses decrease this way, but the buffer fills up this way. So in case we had the GOT table somewhere over here, we could overwrite it with the buffer overflow. Can you see? Yeah, it goes up like that, right? So the first thing that it does is it shifts this uh, GOT simply moved from the program's variable so that it cannot be overwritten into unless a format string is used. We have a special format string uh, called percentage %n which helps us write percentage %n. What uh, the, this it it displays this uh, format string we write in the Wikipedia page. Uh, thing was printf. Yeah, n format specifier n. It prints nothing but writes the number of characters written so far into an integer pointer parameter. So it takes a parameter. That's the special part of this. It takes a parameter, which is an address. So it writes into a particular address. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to find the address of the GOT table. Okay. Uh, this will become very clear to, uh, in the next session when we do it properly, but I'm just giving you an idea. We find the address of the GOD table and we pass that as a parameter for this format specifier. Uh, and we are able to write the number of bits of bytes printed so far into that address now. Okay, so that's how we're able to override GOD. Back to our slides. This is uh, in partial railroad. Now, full railroad in this case, all symbols in the binary are resolved before execution. So there's no lazy binding taking place at all. The entire GOT is then marked read only as there's no longer a need for PLD to override the GOT entries. So there is now no GOT.PLT section. Uh, even the functions, before I said fun uh, the constants are um, uh, uh, resolved during load time and the functions are resolved while it's executing right 
now everything is resolved during load time and there's a single got section which already has the addresses of everything there is nothing there's nothing that's going to be resolved while the pro, when when the function is called this option completely secures the binary against a got override attack also once it yeah it makes it read only that's already mentioned the only problem with this is that the program takes much longer to load since all symbols are resolved at the beginning so overall time will be the same because i have to resolve all those functions at some point or the other either in like while running the uh, uh, execute ex executable like while the code part of it is being run or during load time so it has to be resolved at some point so overall time will probably be the same okay the basic right to got attack um okay we'll be doing that next session now there are some things that i didn't discuss in too much detail let me go back to that i want to tell you something about um the things mentioned here um when we do file hello world we get to see some things about you we get to see elf 64 bit lsv pi executable x86 64 version whatever dynamically linked or uh, not stripped these things are i just like in case this wasn't very clear we could discuss this Okay, so the first thing is, what is ELF? It's uh, the Linux's version of an executable. Yeah, it's a Linux executable. Different operating uh, systems have different kinds of executables. Like um, on Windows, it's PE. On Mac OS, it's OS X. Okay, so. Yeah, this is just FYI. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to spell that. Maybe uh, okay. Um, yeah. So this that's an ELF file. Then yeah, you know, sixty-four bit. Uh, okay. I hope you know X uh, X eighty six is um the the what do you call it? The architecture for, or the type of assembly code we used, or you, we used. I think different kinds of, um, yeah. So uh, the, the assembly code that we're more used to because our systems are uh, Intel x86. Uh, so x86 is, a, is an Intel thing. Yeah. And uh, it has a, specific form of assembly language. Oh, do you, hope you guys know what assembly language is. Yeah, then you probably also know what x86 is. OK, and it's a 64 bit architecture. Now, dynamically linked. So when you do a file, you get to know all this information. You know if it's dynamically linked or not. OK, all this. Um, and the last thing, not stripped. That's actually pretty important for um, your exploits. This means that it has uh, it has headers and it it has uh, it has symbol it still has its symbol tables it has debugging information it has dynamic linking information all that it has so for an elf file there are two uh, symbol tables not strip means it still has its symbol tables intact and still simple uh, and its uh, file header intact so yeah also an elf file has uh, three parts to it so the first one is the header and we're right now talking about the header section yeah the header has two simple tables one of them is called s y m d a v this is what gives like GDB, the debugging information. So if it were stripped, we wouldn't. If we if we did disass main, it would be it would say that main doesn't exist. Things like that. So uh, yeah, this really helps in debugging. And the other one is our DYN or SYN. So the yeah, this has this is all the global symbols. 
global symbols as in the symbols that are uh, from the libraries, stuff, stuff like that. Dynamically linking stuff. And the sim tab has everything. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a larger um, uh, uh, symbol table. It has everything that's present in Ding, sim plus other things which are like the local um, uh, it'll have the names of the local functions and local variables all that like whatever is defined in your specific program so all that information also is helping debug information so what does this help in? if you want to recreate your um, program it's able to assign similar names for the variables and the functions and all that so that's that's what these that's what non strip means. It's, it's pretty cool. And I think I have some more things. Yeah. Oh, it also says which line. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing it does is that it does which line of source code um, um, does the particular instruction correspond to in the assembly code. So when we do GDB, uh, sure. And we do disas main. Yeah. So there are uh, all these instructions, right? So like the, all these instructions, but they correspond to. Uh, I can also tell which line, like maybe not here, I'm not really sure, but I can also tell exactly which line of the source code do those many assembly instructions correspond to. So one line of source code could be equal to multiple lines of assembly code, right? Because maybe in that they say it's a for loop. There'll be multiple jump uh, uh, jump statement, multiple comparison statements, uh, stuff like that. So you know, assembly instructions. So it, it even gives you that information, which line of source code does it correspond to? Okay. Um, yeah. And really, okay, um, because we have some time left. Maybe I'll try to reinstall uh, Jeff and fix and figure that out. So you get some time, write down all your doubts in the um, comment section if you have any. And I'll be, if, if I'm able to do it right now, maybe in five minutes, I'll try. If I can install it again now, uh, I'll, I'll be able to show you the demo. Okay. Okay, another thing, how many of you have Jeff installed already, like running with your GDP? It's a very useful tool. Um, just raise your hands if you already have, have been using GEF or uh, along with uh, your GDP. It gives you a lot more information and it makes exploits easier. Yeah. Raise your hands if you already have it. Okay. Okay, so if I have time, I'll probably show you how to install that too. It's it's really cool.
Okay, I'm not able to um, install it right now. Some, I, have, I don't have space on my device. So um, I'll show the demo later. This is it for today's class. Yeah, you may leave. Thanks.